Zardoz, of course, referring to John Borman's cult 1974 sci-fi epic, which presents us with a distant future of ecological ruin, technological immortality, and Sean Connery in a bright red jockstrap. Yet, past all the kitsch and Connery, Borman's film serves as a powerful critique of the cybernetics movement, accelerationism, and indeed calls us to brace, embrace sorry, a new form of utopian community, one grounded in solidarity and our human finitude against all attempts at infinite consumption and infinite gratification. That is indeed the thesis of the latest Zero Utopia title, Against the Vortex, Zardoz and Degrowth Utopias in the 70s and today, and joining me to discuss the book and Zardoz is the author Anthony Galuzzo. Anthony, cheers for joining me today. Hey, how's it going? So, for the uninitiated, could we, could we just take a, a, a tour through the world of Zardoz? You know, what, first, you know, what is Zardoz? Can we get like a brief summary of sort of the main themes? Maybe we can get to a plot summary as we go along. And then I guess on top of that, you know, what drew you to this book as an archetypal demonstration of a kind of radically, um, a radical kind of anti acceleration or decelerationist philosophy? Um, well, <laughs> Zardoz is a very strange 1974 you know, science fiction film. Although, I mean, it's 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 a it's a science fiction film. And maybe we could talk about this in a little bit. It very much positions itself against um, what were the dominant modes of of science fiction, both in film and 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 and, and literature, or at least popular literature at the time. Um, you know, it was made by by John Borman, who prior to making Zardoz was best known for uh, the movie Deliverance, which is which is a very different film, you know, about uh, James Dickey adaptation about a bunch of these sort of you know well-to-do Southern men who go on a river rafting trip uh, that doesn't turn out so well, um, <laughs> uh, but. The next sort of significant film, he, I think Borman did make a few smaller films um, in between Deliverance and Zardoz, but the next, the next significant significant film that he made was this very bizarre movie that's somewhat post-apocalyptic. Um, it's set in 2293. Um, you know, you've heard the, the first shot of the film, though it seems like you're in some kind of primeval landscape. Uh, you have these, these strange men on many of them on horseback in these sort of red leather outfits. Um, they're wearing stone masks and they're all genuflecting before this, this giant floating stone head. And you notice that the stone masks are in fact representations of the stone head. And then one of the first, well, the first thing that the stone head says um, is that uh, the gun is good and the penis is evil, you know, uh, the penis shoots seeds that poison the earth with the disease of man. I, mean, I might be getting wording a little bit, wording's a little bit off. Um, while, while the gun, you know, cleanses the earth um, of that same disease. And, and this, this floating stone head uh, very much evokes a kind of, uh, you know, Bronze Age God. I mean, I, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a connection, I think, that Borman is partly making with... Uh, the God of the Old Testament um, in particular. Um, and then, uh, yeah, this strange story unfolds. Um, Sean Connery uh, plays the leader of this, this group of men in those strange outfits. I mean, he's in this uh, kitschy outfit. Um, it turns out he is a member, a leader of, of this group called the Exterminators. Um, and they go around killing you know, the sort of immiserated population of, of the earth, the brutals um, at the behest of this God. But the, the movie really begins when Connery is, is snuck into the head um, and discovers that the head is in fact a kind of a, a spaceship that's being piloted by this strangely clothed figure. Uh, Connery kills this figure, I mean, we learn later the figure only, only I mean, he dies, but he's, he's brought back to life. Um, and the, sh and this, the ship head crashes 
into this oasis that um, in many ways, I mean, you know, it's this oasis that sort of uh, is meant to resemble, at, at first glance, it seems like almost a pastoral utopia, right? All of these, these very attractive um, figures that Connery first encounters are dressed in sort of pre, pre-Raphaelite costume. But it turns out it's actually a very high tech uh, utopian community called the Vortex. Um, The Vortex is organized under the aegis of a supercomputer called the Tabernacle. Uh, The figures within the Vortex are known as the Eternals. Um, uh, They have, you know, God-like powers, um, mostly by way of this this AI technology um, that's been developed. And they also, they don't die in the sense that their bodies grow old, but uh, they're able to sort of download their, their consciousness into these new bodies that are regrown by the tabernacle, the supercomputer, uh, which stores, you know, the genetic codes of these various people. Um, in its, in its database. So, you know, uh, Connery is seen as, as, as an nativism at first, uh, you know, uh, throwback, a brutal, they want to kill him. Um, but it's also, it's also revealed that the exterminators, Connery, are actually, actually working unbeknownst to themselves um, for, for the Eternals. It's, 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 the Eternals are able to maintain this high-tech, cornucopian island, largely by way of extracting resources and managing the population of this immiserated human majority outside of the walls in the outlands. And, and you know, these, these stone heads are a way of sort of, uh, you know, effectively um, managing their, this, this, this force of enforcers. Um, over the course of the film, uh, you know, I mean, as Connery sort of discovers that his whole lie, you know, his whole life rather has been, has been a lie, um, um, a ruse, we also learn that this, this seeming utopia is a false one, um, that um, there is a, a significant uh, component of the eternal population that's absolutely miserable um, with each new sort of replication, as I said, their bodies are regrown. There's an increasing population of what's called the apathetics. Um, You know, these Eternals who are cognitively impaired in in a seemingly catatonic state. There's also this kind of um, what's what's soft authoritarian rule. I mean, there's a set of sort of unwritten codes uh, amongst the Eternals, and if anyone, one of the characters in the film who sort of takes on um, takes on the Connery character Zed as a pet, uh, does this. If you violate these codes, uh, you're aged as opposed to in prison. So the, we have this population of renegades, these sort of uh, senile, uh, decrepit Eternals who they grow old. They, they've been made to grow old, but they can't die. And what they want most of all is to die. And then, you know, the big reveal, of course, is that Connery himself has been engineered by a dissident group of um, renegades exactly to sort of bring an end uh, to to the vortex, um, to, to, to bring the, the, the gift of death, um, to, to take down the tabernacle, um, which, which he eventually does. Um, I mean, there are other elements as well that are interesting. I mean, uh, there's no sex. There's no sexual reproduction um, in the vortex. I mean, why would they need sexual reproduction? They, they, they live forever. They're able to sort of reproduce in this kind of high-tech artificial way. Um, and, and Connery sort of reintroduces sex, reintroduces birth um, alongside death into the vortex. Um, I mean, it's a very, very, uh, one of the most difficult parts of writing the book was, I mean, I, I'd written most of the manuscript, um, but I think my, my editor um, at Zero, um, Carl Neville, was like, you have, to, you have to summarize the plot of the movie, which is 
It's very difficult to do. I mean, one of the things that made it easy though is that um, Borman, you know, originally wrote this movie in the in, a, in, in prose in the form of a novel, and then they he and Bill Stair, who worked on the film with him, converted it into a shooting script. And then Borman went back and he actually wrote a Zardoz novel with Stair um, later in that same year. And in many ways, I mean, that this novelization is very, very interesting and it fills in a lot of the holes and incoherencies that you might see um, in the plot of the movie, although not, not, although not all of them. So, I mean, you know, the, the book is... I mean, I'm looking at the film. Um, I'm also looking at the text. I mean, you know, the, I mean, there are ways in which you can think about the film's visual registers almost separate from, you know, the very sort of baroquely complex narrative. And I mean, it's sort of, you asked me how, why this movie, how I discovered it. I think I must have been in high school. Um, I was with a, a good friend of mine, and I think we, we must have watched the movie. I don't know. We were under the influence of some kind of hallucinogenic, and it sort of lends itself. It's a hallucinatory movie that lends itself to, uh, you know, hallucinogenic uh, viewership. It's just and it just kind of stuck in my mind. Not not the plot. Uh, just these these strange images. I mean, it really looks. Um, it has this very distinctive look. This unlike. Uh, most science fiction films, particularly of that era, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, we could get into this. It's the sort of antithesis of something like 2001 and the sort of high, mo what I call the high modernist or the hyper modernist um, science fiction film. And then, you know, I went, I guess I, you know, I, I, I saw it again. I mean, I thought it had some interesting themes. I, I, you know, I mean, at, at the time, uh, you know, there were a lot of left align critics mm. who saw it as you know reactionary i mean particularly the gender politics i i don't i don't think that's true and i, I sort of contest that at length um in the book um you know why i decided to come back to it more recently is um very much in response to i mean speaking of the left but very much res in response to you know recent tendencies on the left that we might describe as neo-futurist or you know uh, neo-modernist um you know i mean star trek socialist i mean you know these 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 these, these visions of a kind of cornucopian left future that revolve around um, technology as deus ex machina, but are very much anchored in, I mean, ironically, um, sort of nostalgic evocations of, you know, artifacts like Star Trek or the Jetsons, um, uh, you know, sort of like 1950s, 1960s space opera. So, I, you, know, I, you know, I wanted to sort of push against this um and I, I you know you know thinking zardoz is sort of an interesting if we've talked star trek socialism what would a zardozian socialism or i mean maybe more it would be more accurate to call it something like an echo socialism or an echo communism mm. but just give you a, little, a broad overview no, I mean, in terms of the sort of the other Star Trek, I mean, even beyond the idea of socialism attached to it, I mean, I've been so recently. I've done a few shows with uh, we did one for uh, Acid Rise and then one with another zero author, uh, Josh Davila, on his channel about this new thing called ex effective accelerationism, which is essentially the tech thing they're saying. You know, we we can make things too cheap to meter if we simply double down on everything we're already doing. And I think it, it is an interesting speculative tendency. I mean, it even goes, I mean, it goes all the way back to you know the Russian cosmists like Fedorov, or even a recent book may call it a splash. For example, like fully automated luxury communism um, by by Vistani, and then of course that sort of became a sort of meme on its own. I mean, that's that's. I mean, that's um. Effective altruism, right? Yeah. Sorry? Are you talking about effective altruism? Like, uh, is that, that what you're talking uh, about? It's a new thing, and it's even worse, called effective accelerationism. Oh, I mean, it's the effective altruism, I, I guess. I mean, that was Bankman Freed's rationale mm. for, for what he did, right? Like, I mean, it's also like sort of a justification of, 
it's like a, a kind of like you know means ends sort of logic and justification of, of terrible deeds in the present with the there's there's a model of infinity that they sort of go on i mean maybe let's get into the eternals actually because i think one of the cool things about the eternals when you talk about the eternals is that you talk about them one of your critiques of the eternals as these kind of stand-ins for a kind of hyper modernist ideology which i guess we should get into first in terms of you know what what do you think they're standing in for but also just on top of that just to talk about you know why that goes wrong for them in zardoz because there's something you talk about you talk about you know, the the, ap- the apathetics the boredom of living forever and in the book, you actually critique them, uh, this idea of sort of infinity in a lot of this techno sort of technological sort of reasoning, using an idealist. You use like it's a uh, Martin Hagelin's this life, all right? It's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really like Hegel, and it's quite it's quite funny because it reminds me of Hegel's idea of a bad infinity, a bad yeah, the infinity just a straight line just goes on and on and on and on, and his critique of it is says you know. People think about this as the most sublime infinity, but it's not sublime. It's boring. The, mo- the, 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 the critiques of infinity that Hegel gives is that it is precisely what makes you apathetic. So I think let's let's get into the 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 Eternals. What you think they're standing in for? Not just standing in for, but what you know. You also talk about Borman's uh, sort of his own sort of, uh, sort of investigations into like these sort of cybernetic communes in California. Let's, let's, un- let's unpack the Eternals, the, the master pole of this master servant dialectic before we get into to, to Zed. Okay. Um, I, I just want to, I mean, it was sort of interesting when you're talking about uh, Hegel and bad infinity, it made me, and you described it as boring. It sort of made me think of the end of 2001, which is kind of boring. That long, that long sequence in which, Kubrick is trying to sort of envision infinity. And I think exactly that sense, I don't know if he's trying to do it in a, in a, in a positive or a negative light, but it's wh- whether intentional or not, I mean, that, that sequence is, is kind of boring. I mean, I'm also thinking about, you mentioned Hogland um, and this life. I mean, the other thinker, nobody's actually asked me about him. I mean, I don't know. I guess he's, He's, he's long been unfashionable, but Norman O'Brown, um, who wrote Life Against Death, I mean, that's a product of the late 50s, but it became a kind of a countercultural Bible. But a lot of that's about accepting death, and, you know, he's got this very sort of comp- complicated uh, revisionist take on life and the life and death instinct in Freud. But he specifically talks, he specifically invokes. I mean, Hegel and Hegel's point that it's actually death um, that that is the precondition for our individuality. Right? Yeah, and it's, 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 it's Hegel's sort of critique of, 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 and I think it comes out of Hegel's critique of Spinozism, et cetera, right? It's like, you know, this, this idea of, I mean, and to, and to bring this back to the Eternals, right? It's like this... You know, I mean, uh, they are, yeah, you know, there are these, these, these figures who, I mean, I, you know, they're, they're like, it's like, it's, it's eternity on the model of the assembly line, right? Um, I mean, they're endless, their bodies are sort of endlessly mm. replicated over, I mean, in this case, centuries, but hypothetically could go on um forever i mean you know they're i mean you know they're they're sort of you know they're sort of an endlessly kind of reproducible and upgradable come come on life as an endlessly reproducible and upgradable commodity i mean it's sort of the bad infinity of it's it's a bad sort of capitalist infinity of course i mean the idea being with the endlessly upgradable commodity is that it improves. Um, yep. But in the case of the Eternals, I think that Borman has a very uh, clever and incisive uh, take on that, which is that there's this sort of, I mean, there's actual degradation within a significant proportion of the population in the form of the apathetics. But then, you know, there's this, there's this sort of internal enemy or ennui because, you know, 
individual identity itself needs the clear demarcations, um, I think, of beginning and end, um, of finitude. I mean, you know, I don't know how many people mm. know the Hoglin book, but, you know, Hoglin's whole point is that, you know, the only reason that anything you do has significance or weight um, is because, you know, you, you, could, you know, you have a finite uh, amount of time in the world. Um, you could choose this um, as opposed to that. I mean, you're always sort of risking the consequences. What you choose might result in failure and heartbreak, but I mean, it's, it's exactly that, that there's a relationship between that weight um, and uh, uh, temporal, the horizon of temporality, which I would say encompasses both, you know, finitude, death, but also, also birth, right? So I think, I, mean, I, I think that, um, I, I think that Borman is, 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 is really, you know, I, I think he recognizes this in his depiction of the Eternals. I mean, something I didn't get a chance to ask him, and I don't know even if I did, if how, how he would respond. But, I mean, it's interesting because the early 1970s was a moment, and I talk about this a bit in the book, where people were sort of grappling with, with death. Mm. I mean, there was a death acceptance movement, right? Um, I mean, you had books like Ernest Becker's The Denial of Death. Um, yeah, then you had Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's, this, the psychologist's work on, you know, death and the stages of grief. A lot of these texts were um, actually, you know, drawing sometimes in critical ways on Norman O. Brown's work. So that was part of the intellectual background um, out of which you know, a film like Zardoz came. And I, you know, I don't know to what extent, you know, Borman was consciously engaging with this material or not, but, I don't know. I mean, it definitely it would definitely show in the film because, you know, the film, as you said, it has, it has ecological aspects. It has, you know, the aspects of population management, nuclear war, and it's, it's incredibly, I mean, prescient as well in, in relation to this, particularly in terms of the way in which, you know, there is an elite like the Eternals and they are, sort of complicit in this system, even if they might not like it. I mean, one of my favorite lines in the film is when Consuela, one of the sort of the, the, one of the main leaders of the Vortex, played by Charlotte Rampling, says, you know, I, I don't like the idea. I always voted against the idea that we should enslave the, the brutals, you know, outside to make bread for, you know, to, to grow food for us. And then uh, <laughs> May turns to her and says, well, you eat the bread. You know, there, there is a real sense of, sort of uh, taking out this i mean very wizard of oz and yeah you know, sort of spirit of it and of course sardoz in, in the movie comes from it's put together from wizard of oz it is just the, the plots of um having this giant imposing wizard-like figure this magical figure in in this, you know to, to, to give you this sense of that there's a meaning to the world which justifies your place in it as a subjugated person i mean to that extent i mean yeah let's bring it in where do you think zardoz stands as opposed to these other visions of the future you've already mentioned, for example. Yeah, so mo think about, I mean, Star Trek. I mean, even stuff like Battlestar Galactica that was in at the time. But particularly, yeah, Star Trek. And, I mean, this is a, a spoiler, listeners, but uh, me and Anthony actually spoke with John Borman. And that will be hopefully out at some point uh, in, the, in the near future. And he, one of the things he spoke about a lot was his relationship to, to Stanley Kubrick in 2001, The Space Odyssey. And it seems like in a way he's kind of doing a parody of that as well. Well, no, he said, he said he was doing a parody of that, yeah. but we don't, we don't need to speculate. <laughs> well, that was actually a very validating moment for me because that's actually one of the, that's one of my argue, some of the claims they make in the book, right? And I, I mean, I don't know, to have him confirm that. I mean, I, I do think that it's, it's a kind of a, I, mean, I think, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I make this claim in the book and this came up in the, in the, in the uh, interview. I think one of the reasons why so many people uh, so many, you know, sci-fi fans and, and others sort of dismiss Zardoz as kind of, as, as kind of ridiculous. It's because it has all of these, you know, comical and campy elements, right? And, and you know, I mean, sci-fi in, the, in, in a kind of a hyper-modernist register, I think 2001 is, is, is the great example, but also 
you know, Star Trek was Star Trek, yeah, particularly this, that in Star Trek is oftentimes inadvertently campy. But yeah, you know, it's like this very self serious, right? Um, and, you know, Zardoz has got all these sort of ridiculous elements. I mean, you know, Connery in that outfit. Um, and, you know, and it's the, that's not the only sort of ridiculous outfit he dons in the film. And at one point, he's, you know, he's on the run uh, from these, you know, from the eternal leaders who are trying to hunt him down. And he's in, he's in a wedding dress. Um, but I, I, I do think that, 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 that Borman was, uh, was, was, was parodying um, what was, you know, a, a kind of a, a popular form, what particularly in, in the post-war, you know, context in, in the developed core was sort of developing into a kind of a, a, a folklore of, you know, modernization theory, right? The, the folklore of a particular narrative um, of progress. And I think, I, mean, I you know, I think Borman, so sort of a literary fellow, was very much hearkening back to, for example, uh, Swift's work. I'm uh, thinking of like Gulliver's Travels uh, and the island of Laputa, you know, these, these, these kind of, uh, you know, projectors, inventors on a flying island, you know, they're doing things like they're trying to turn shit back into reconstitute shit as, as food. And, um, you know, I mean, people like uh, Samuel Butler, I mean, some of selectively, some I think of, of Huxley's work, like, you know, sort of, you know, I mean, the sort of comical and satirical, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's in many ways, it's a comical and, and satir, it's a satirical work. And what he's satirizing is, you know, a particular mode of space opera that was very much aligned with I mean, you know, in the Western context, I mean, at that point, very much aligned with, you know, American visions of of of, develop, of industrial and technological development, and I, I I think people don't, you know, I, I, people don't um, get that, and I, I I don't know, I it's mm. it's it's just it's 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 mystifying to me. Uh, how many, you know, I mean, particularly, you know, people on the left, it's fetishize. Uh, I keep coming back to Star Trek because I know, like, I, you know, I know that that, 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 that people, someone's writing another, another book on it. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, I have to say, I mean, I was, you know, I, mm. I had a bit of a falling out. I, no, not a bit of a falling out. I guess I had a significant falling out with the, um, editorial board of Jacobin several years ago kind of shifted my perspective and a lot mm -hmm. of ways I was much more aligned with that perspective um, maybe 10 years ago and you know I mean I, I read this book by a guy named Peter Fraze a book called Four Futures where yeah you know I mean it's this kind of like left-wing exercise in futurology which is sort of strange when you think about the kind of the orthodox Marxist band on, uh, was it recipes for the cookshops of the future? It's like we're doing this, kind of like, yeah. we're doing this like left Alvin Toffler thing. But, you know, he's got like four hypothetical futures and, um, you know, they're really good. And, and all of these futures are anchored in his readings of, you know, sci-fi books. And like the first one, you know, the one that that he clearly prefers is this kind of like Star Trek future of, of techno cornucopian abundance. And I just remember, you know, he's talking about um, replicators, you know, on Star Trek, they have these things, replicators, they can just, effectively it's magic, right? They can make, it's like out, it's like the, the realization of the old alchemist dream, you know, even more magical, like just make something out of nothing. And, Somehow, like I remember, phrase sort of connected it to 3D printers. And, you know, I mean, 3D printers feature in a lot of uh, contemporary science fiction. Of course, I mean, 3D printers need inputs, <laughs> which are subject to the same resource constraints as any material input. 
So it's not really like a replicator. I, I don't know. I, I guess, uh, you know, so a lot of this is, is, is sort of pushing against that. And, and, you know, I mean, trying, to, I mean, without abandoning not the not utopia. It's, it's it's too overused at this point. This term is just, but and yeah, I mean it's something like the utopian impulse. But at the same time, trying to think the utopian impulse alongside real echo material limits, right? And for, for two reasons, I think. I mean, uh, this sort of goes back to what we were talking about before. I think what's interesting about Zardoz, the the film and the novelization, is that you know this this the story, the narrative, in some ways addresses what we might call hard concerns, um, having to do with you know resource constraints and global ecological inequities between let's just say south and north on the one hand so sort of a set of hard concerns um that i would think marxist materialists would be concerned with as well as quote unquote soft concerns right of course qualitative concerns you know related to issues like alienation um what makes for a good life um what allows for human flourishing so in other words i mean i th- i think there is i i i think in zardoz i mean you see that that the the kind of technological cornucopia of the vortex is very you know is very much dependent on you know devastation and hyper exploitation outside the vortex walls Right, so I mean, this is a world that I mean, it's it's unclear what's happened to the Earth. It could have been a nuclear war, ecological devastation, a combination of both. I mean, if you read the if you read the novel, Borman makes it much clearer that the, most of the brutals are suffering from mutations, like due to some kind of either radioactive fallout or or or, or toxicity of some sort. Um, but yeah, you know, but those people are. I mean, you know. So, but those those resource the, the resources that are left on the earth are, you know, I mean, are extracted. The population of the brutals are kept, you know, within certain boundaries. And then there's also a certain point where instead of killing the brutals, the exterminators start to enslave them and force them to grow cereal crops, um, you know, to, to service an increasing population of apathetics within the vortex. So even in that case, it's interesting, right? It's like, you know, you have this whole issue of surplus population, biopolitical management outside the vortex walls. And the solution for the most part is just to like kill them. Um, But then there's another surplus population within the vortex walls and they have to be maintained through uh, the hyper exploitation of of, of the other, the the other and I think, I mean, Borman was in, engaged with, with issues. I mean, he was very aware of, like, for instance, the legacies of British colonialism in particular. I mean, you know, in several interviews that he did time of the film, um, I mean, he, he, he talks about, um, you know, raising standards of living due to technology within the global north and declining standards of living in the global south. Um, and he sort of connects the two. I mean, I think he's, you know, he is emphasizing in a certain way um, this idea of uh, un- uneven ecological exchange. And also this idea that, you know, the sort of high tech or the, 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 the sort of the, the technosphere um, of the global north I mean, is is actually a kind of congealed form of uneven exchange um, that relies on both ecological appropriation and, um, you know, exploitation. That this sort of fantasy that you, I mean, I, I think it's a fantasy just for, for empirical reasons. It's a fantasy that, you know, what's his name? Bastani uh, puts forth. That somehow, that you, you could somehow globalize like the american way of life right and you know there are any number of people 
who are much, you know, you know, scientists who sort of, you know, who, who looked at this empirically and said, you know, you'd need like six planets. And, you know, Bastani resorts to things like we can mine a- asteroids and, uh, you know, um, so I, you know, I, I think, I mean, he's addressing those concerns, right? So he's, he's, he's addressing these concerns of real limits, sort of like the, the limits to growth, to sort of reference the, you know, the, the popular, the famous, or the infamous uh, UN report of the time. He's, he put, at the same time that he pushes back on like a, a strictly neo-Malthusian view that it's, it's, it has, it's all about just, uh, just raw population numbers. And the problem is always with increasing population in the global South, not the global North. There's nothing to do with you know, global North, you know, production consumption patterns. It has to do with just, it has to do with the fact like, you know, Paul, guys like Paul Ehrlich or even more infamously Garrett Harding. It's just that, you know, there are too many people in India. So, you know, um, so we have to, instead of a spaceship, we need a lifeboat in the affluent West. I think, uh, you know, for Borman is like, that's a ruse too. Right. It's, it's sort of like, you know, that's a way of deflecting attention mm-hmm. from the fact that it's actually industrial capitalist patterns of production consumption um, that are driving the ecological crisis. But there are real limits, I think. I think I mean, I, that's I think that's and But on the other side, he's also talking about things that most. You know, most Marxists like would sort of reject is, I don't know petty bourgeois or idealist or romantic concerns, you know, having to do with what makes for a good life. You know, it's like, all right, let's, let's look at, let's look at the eternals, you know, putting all of those, those concerns about global patterns of inequity, resource limits and extraction aside for a moment. Here you have these people who supposedly have everything right they live in a kind of post-scarcity you know cornucopia i mean they have they live eternally in a way and they're absolutely miserable um i think i mean i I think that's a challenge to a lot of if we're talking about the left like orthodox marxists right because uh in in a sense i mean it's it's a challenge just in a sort of a, a basic it's methodological, the, the right word. This, this idea that this is a, this, this is kind of way in which a lot of Orthodox Marxists they kind of laugh at, at no, normative concerns, like they you know mm-hmm. the, the, the sort of nineteen oh it's we're, we're, it's science, it's the science of his, the science of historical laws or economic laws. When in fact, I mean you know any political project um, necessarily is is normative. I mean there's mm-hmm. there's always a, a vision. Um, of a, the good life, the good collective life, human flourishing. I mean, the only whether it's explicit or implicit. And I, I think, I mean, one of the things that's interesting with the film is sort of yoking us together. And he's saying, even on this, that, that, those, in, 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 on that qualitative level, mm. both a recognition and an acceptance of limits and self-limitation, both individually and collectively, are actually the preconditions for for freedom. And flourishing. So, I, you know, that's that's kind of like the crux of of my argument, and it's it's the crux of my argument with, you know, a lot of tendencies today. I mean, obviously, tendencies on, on the right, which are more kind of explicitly horrible. You know, Elon Musk mm-hmm. and long termists and singularity people, but also these sort of tendencies on on the left that that I've been, you know. That, I mean, because this is the milieu that I was coming out of. Mm. And, you know, I often went along with a lot of this, you know, I was like a kind of a, I guess, a soft trot for a while. <laughs> but, uh, um, but. As long as you're not a positive kind of alien trot, I think, I think everything's, everything's usually quite safe. I mean, uh, I mean, in terms of, I mean, yeah, I mean, one of the things I guess to extrapolate on terms of what your own thought is bringing as well, which is on top of this, is that you extrapolate from Borman, uh, you put him within a lineage of thinkers that you call, uh, perhaps you call a critical Aquarianism, of course, drawing the idea of the age of Aquarius, and you cite, you, know, you put Borman alongside the likes of people, for example, like Ivan Illich, 
Andre Gores, Norman O'Brown, and of course the earlier days of like James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, who famously came up with you know, the Gaia hypothesis. So, mm. what is what is critical Aquarianism? And I guess I guess just get go back to Zardoz again. How does that example? Is Zardoz the first critically aquatic? Is that a good way to put it? Cinema. <laughs> Hmm. That's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess you know, I've been sort of grappling with, uh, you know, that the heritage of of the '60s and the '70s, um, you know, for a while now. And again, I, you know, it's, it's 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 interesting, right? Like, I mean, you know, the '60s and the '70s sort of fell out of favor. Um, mm. I guess you know, I don't know what you want to call it, like in the last uh, sort of this sort of post-occupy, like the the, the, the the millennial socialist left, right? I mean, this idea like, oh, you know, we know these sort of takes that, you know, the, 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 the 60s and the 70s, the new left ultimately led to a new spirit of, 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 of capitalism, I guess sort of a valorization of, of, of individualism, lifestyle, um, identity over, over, over class and, and, and class um, identity. I mean, who's, I can't, I'm, I'm, is it Dan, Daniel, is it Zamora, his name, who's always writing these, yeah. these, these takedowns of Michel Foucault, or, you know, Mich Michel Foucault, you know, the big, you know, he went, the big problem was he went to, uh, what is it? he went to Death Valley in 1960. And apparently that was what convinced Gorbachev you know, to do perestroika or something. I don't know what Daniel's on these yeah. days. <laughs> and then, you know, and sometimes it, it you know, it, it gets, it, you know, oftentimes it's like, it's just this absolute rejection of um, a cultural experimentation. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, a, I mean, really they're, they're sort of ripping this off. They're, they're ripping Thomas Frank off. who did a version of this, the bat, you know, the, 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 one of the founders of the Baffler did a version of this in the nineties when it was much more warranted because he was talking about sort of what, what was happening in, in Silicon Valley and the way that they were using these sort of countercultural signifiers. He in turn was kind of doing like a pop version um, of Adorno. I mean, at the same time, I mean, obviously there are lines of continuity to be drawn from certain segments of the counterculture. I mean, before the interview, we were talking about, Stuart Brand, uh, the whole Earth catalog. I mean, there is a there is a, a line like this. I did the California ideology, right? That you could draw from like certain segments of, of the of the counterculture to you know certain segments of the cyber culture of the 1990s. And really, I mean, you, you know that 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 next wave of of capitalist um, accumulation. A lot of these like new these these newest left critiques of the 60s and 70s are often incoherent, though, right? Because they'll 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 cite that, but they'll also talk about hippies as as primitivists, right? As as, mm. as these awful primitivists. So they're both they're primitivists, and yet you know they're responsible for uh, Silicon Valley. I mean, you know, I, I think for me the place to start was like it was the, the, the what we call the new left in the counterculture, and I'm more focusing on the Anglo American, the English speaking world for the most part when I'm talking about critical Aquarianism, was variegated. And this seems like a truism, but in a lot of the kind of more tendentious accounts of the 60s and the 70s, I mean, you don't you don't really get that sense. They're sort of reduced to one thing, right? I mean, there certainly was a, a kind of uh, hippie modernism, uh, the, the, this California ideology, um, uh, you know. I mean, there certainly what there certainly were these these lifestyle cults, the cults of the South. But I also think that. You know, I mean, if you look at, I mean, it was, was, it was kind of an incredibly sort of diverse counter public sphere. And you also had figures who were very much aware of, of, of those tendencies in the counterculture and, and very, very critical um, of them at the time. Um, I mean, you know, critical of, you know, let's just say techno utopianism. I mean, there were neo Luddite. Um, Currents. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, we mentioned a figure like Ivan Illich, but there was a whole critical and alternative technology movement. So I'm thinking of people like um, Langdon Winner, um, John Noble, who were really, I mean, they were really rejecting the sort of simple vulgar Marxist division between like a neutral forces of production 
um, and you know re the relations of production. You know, you could just you know so we could we could take over the you know the factories as long as long as it's under socialist management, then you know you know the, the, the factory will then utterly sort of transform and you know there are like ridiculous versions of this where people seem to think that you know with the coming of, of socialism or communism like the laws of thermodynamics uh will change <laughs> like gravity will go into reverse um but there were there were people who were really sort of they were, they were critiquing that they were critiquing some of these other tendencies in the counterculture um you know there are people like um there, there was there were these echo feminists um people like carolyn merchant um, um, and you know, and I mean, there were there were these these people who were sort of articulating these 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 critiques in a theoretical form, but then I think it also informed a lot of the imaginative work of the era. So I mean, like mm -hmm. another another uh, this is a, this is interesting to me, like Ursula Le Guin, the science fiction mm -hmm. author. I mean, some. I mean, you would you would think, oh, Ursula Le Guin and, and Zara are informing. There doesn't seem to be much connection. But I think, in some ways, she was doing, particularly, you know, her work in the '70s. You know, she, she was doing something similar with what Borman is doing in Zara's. I mean, it was a kind of a an imaginative form, an imminent critique of the sort of the dominant tendencies in science fiction writing, which was like you know, Robert Heinlein, mm -hmm. like you know, like these these kind of macho, you know, hard sci-fi tech obsessed space operas right and i it's you know and it, it's 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 sort of interesting she was often and she was doing it within the form um of the space opera uh you know argument but it was you know clearly allegorical but if you look at some of the you know those this, this, the heinous the, the heinous cycle right they're in this sort of they're, they're set in the same universe i mean uh, the dispossessed um which is clearly, I mean, her attempt to take stock not only of the hard science fiction, the, the, the hard, hard science fiction tradition, but you know, uh, the utopian tradition, incorporating, I mean, you know, uh, some of the anti, the, the, the more powerful anti-utopian critiques of that utopian tradition. Um, it's 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 interesting because she's been taken up by some of these people I'm calling Star Trek socialists. I think they get her wrong. Um, I think someone like Russell Hoban, um, Ridley Walker. I mean, so I mean, you know, it's, it's it's so I'm trying to sort of map a constellation of thinkers, a particular segment um, within the Anglo-American counterculture, you know, that were interested in thinking utopia with limits that were interested in ecological concerns, but uh, ecological concern, but, but thinking ecology outside of a kind of a techno technocratic and neo-Malthusian register, um, who are interested in some of the, the qualitative issues that I brought up related to mentality and finitude. I mean, you know, a question that I, I haven't gotten is like, I mean, you know, is that what's the connection between these people I'm calling uh, critical Aquarians and, uh, you know, the, the, the post-68 generation of uh, French philosophers. I mean, you know, I, obviously, I mean, that, that actually had a sort of transformative effect um, in, in, in the English speaking world, particularly within the academy, right? Like, uh, you know, people like Deleuze, Deleuze and, and Derrida, I mean, a lot of these people came out of it, you know, May 1968 and its failure. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's in a very different register, that a lot of that material, right? It's all about um, the linguistic turn. Um, whereas a lot of the thinkers that I'm, that I discuss briefly in the book, are very much, I think, trying to revive a tradition of, of phenomenology. I think at one point in the book, I talk about how, you know, it's like it's like they're trying to sort of merge like some of the concerns we associate with the post-war existentialism with ecology, and a lot of the sort of French post-68 thinkers very much about the sort of critique and rejection of 
phenomenology and existentialism. That said, I mean, I think there are some interesting, and this is if, like if I write the second book, which would focus on critical Aquarianism, qu- critical Aquarianism um, there's some interesting points of overlap, right? Like if you read early people like, you know, the early Baudrillard, mm. right? I mean, he's sort of, he's sort of famous for, you know, sort of theories of the, the simulacrum. I mean, he's, I mean, he's, 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 he's all about the sort of critique of productivism um, in, in Marx. I, I see some of that in Leotard as well, right? I mean, I, you know, I, I do make the connection between critical Aquarianisms and Romanticism. And of course, a lot of those figures were, were interested in, in Romanticism as, as an alternative to at least, you know, the grand narratives of high modernism. So I don't know. I, that's a very sprawling and academic answer, but, you know, I mean, this is, these are, these are some of my, some of my thoughts. I mean, I, I do, I, I want to recover a more positive mm. valence for post, for postmodernism. In other words, you like, you know. at one point as like the the one true traditionalism to the extent that it wants to deconstruct the grand narratives of infinitude, at least in that sort of Star Trek sense. I mean, in terms of the French theory stuff, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, it also people like I mean, uh, Felix Guattari writes the free ecologies, you know, Deleuze, yeah. a huge in like, yeah, their geology, and there is kind of a something of a second order cybernetics to what they're doing with their like use of people like Gregory Batterson who starts you know, doing the ecology of mind, and it feels like. Critical, critical Aquarianism is a sense in which one can talk about a kind of anti-cybernetic cybernetics in the sense of, you know, you can do systems theory, but without the the overreach of this infinite thing of we need to keep mapping, we need more data, we need to keep mapping the territory. There's a, a real political valence to it, which tries to to, to short circuit in a way the kind of the, the overreaching totalitarian tendencies of that. But I mean, I guess, I guess as we're, sort of coming up towards the hour. There's one thing we haven't talked about yet, which is the theme of deceleration. Mm. Now, yeah, you know, yeah, we're we're on zero repeater. You know, there's there's a lot of acceleration this the history of this course <laughs> around this. So but but deceleration, now that's a new card in the deck. Let's let's talk about deceleration. What do you mean by deceleration here? Um and, and how does that relate to say a critique of certain kinds of you know, accelerationist discourses, be it Fully automated luxury communism, you know, left accelerationism, as we see from people to Bastani to, you know, Williams and Cernashek, or maybe even some of the acceleration stuff you get with, I don't know, the CCRU or something, where it gets you know, really weird. Well, I, I think I think that I think that the key to thinking or and or, and or imagining a sort of a viable for me, like, I, 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 and when I say viable, I mean a sort of an ecologically sustainable post-capitalist or even more specifically a socialist or, or communist future would be, you know, we have, we have to think about dismantling, um, you know, significant portions of, you know, what is a, a, a toxic technosphere. So, I mean, the work of dismantling in that, in that Luddite sense, I think is key to a decelerationist program. I think, you know, and, and, you know, actually living, you know, trying to live together collectively and with the earth in, 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 a, in a different way, in a way that recognizes, you know, biophysical limits, but also in a way that, I mean, and this is the normative element, you know, also a way that embraces a kind of collective um, self-limitation. There is there is a lot of overlap with you know what's called I guess degrowth, but you know I don't you know on the one hand I I admire you know the word degrowth because it seems to be just a very deliberate fuck you, <laughs> you know, but you know uh, to a lot of these people that you're talking about as well as just you know sort of a standard you know, economic, you know, capitalist uh, economic sense, which is all about, you know, you know, continuously growing uh, G- GDP, uh, you know, the expansion of exchange value as, 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 the, as the foundation for a rising standard of living 
um, for all. I mean, I think, you know, in the sort of social democrat, democratic and um, even the, the, the socialist iteration of that, I mean, it's, 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 it's fundamentally drawing on some of the same uh, presuppositions more and more and more, except in the socialist iteration, more and more and more, you know, for the, for the working class. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think that's sustainable ecologically and I also think it's it's odd because it doesn't it doesn't actually take account of what actually makes for what would make for a good life what does an emancipated life look like I mean to me it's 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 a slower life it's a life where we all have much more time and I don't think you know I mean I, I'm interested in some of the, the post work you know, post-work theorist weeks, people like that. But I don't, I don't think that necessarily entails like, you know, this Jetsonian fantasy of automation. I mean, I think just by, you know, radically, radically sort of reconfiguring, you know, collective and social life, we would have more free time. I mean, a life after like this, you know, after or without uh, like the circuits of production and consumption, would be one where people would be freed up to have um, a lot more time. But I mean, we need to disassemble. And, and some of these things, like I, I don't, I don't know that you know, self-declared accelerationists would, would would disagree. I don't know. Like for instance, the the the, the uh, petroleum automobile complex, right? I mean, you know that you know the elimination um of cars i mean the entire infrastructure that supports that and then on the other side the reconfiguration in you know a place like the united states which you spent time in the united states the reconfiguration of public space in such a way that it's actually adapted to bipedal creatures like human beings um so i mean i that's what i'm talking about i, I think i mean Co the sato book if you've read him is he talks about um, you know, just degrowth, um, eco communism. I mean, there's a lot of sort of overlap with, with what I'm talking about with decelerationism. Um, but I think decelerationism to me has much more of a, an affective and imaginative appeal. Like, you know, degrowth, de it's easily seized on as people have by um, its acceleration opponents. These people want us to to starve, you know, and, uh, let's just go back into caves and that, that kind of thing. I mean, you know, I, I try to, I, I, I sketch out, now I do think, you know, and there are a lot of, I know that there are a lot of um, problems. I don't know if you know this book, Seeing Like a State by Scott. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of problems with that book. And of course, like the, the standard orthomarxist way of dismissing that book is to talk about how Scott who described himself. He's an you know anthropologist at Yale or something. But I guess I don't know. He had some association with the CIA. Is to is to invoke that, and uh, and then you know you don't have to engage with his work. You think there are some issues with the book, but you know I mean it's very much it's a sort of a it's a it's a critical overview of the kind of what he calls the high modernist projects of uh, social state driven high modernist projects of social transformation. Um, you know, with a particular focus on the, the 20th century. And, you know, I mean, he's very critical of Leninism and Stalinism. He talks about the villagization program in Tanzania. But one interesting element of this book is he talks about, he talks about the extent to which a certain dogmatic version of, of high modernism is very much about aesthetics and it sort of goes by you're talking about moving from from the map to things so this this idea of taking a sort of a, a complex landscape and reducing it to sort of clean geometric lines and then you know it's it's about a certain kind of um visuality right um that's sort of imposed on i mean for instance agricultural landscapes um oftentimes to disastrous effect and, and you know i mean i see I, I see this in another register in the kind of sci-fi imaginary that is being pushed by a lot of these accelerationists that you're referring to right i mean you know they're, they're disappointed 
you know, it's kind of pop version of the fa- the unfinished or the failed project of modernity that the world didn't end up looking like, you know, people imagine, like, well, not people, but, you know, affluent Westerners in places like the U.S. and the U.K. imagined it was going to look in the 1950s and the 60s. It doesn't, it doesn't look like the Jetsons or those Pan Am space terminals um, in 2001, right? And, you know, I, 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 at the end of the book, I just, I kind of sort of provide a tentative sketch of what an alternative future might look like. And I think, you know, it's not, it's not, I don't, I don't offer that as some sort of programmatic utopia. I'm just sort of, it's sort of a, just a kind of a, a thought experiment, right? I mean, where we could have, you know, a certain version of, you know, high-speed computerization, um, but without cars, right? I mean, you might have some high-speed trains, but you might also have animal transport or uh, regenerative regenerative or agroecological farming, um, a kind of a, a mixture um, of approaches and techniques that selectively draw on various traditions. Right? And I think this is something that infuriates a lot of accelerationists or sort of hypermodernists. And it infuriates them because it violates their sense of you know, aesthetic decorum. This sort of, and I think, I mean, this is one of the interesting things about one iteration of postmodernism, this idea of bricolage or mixture, right? But I think that's necessary. I mean, you know, it's, that's necessary. I mean, that's necessarily what. I think a sustainable eco-socialist future would look like. It would, it would mix, I mean, it would mix, it would also mix organiz- organizational forms. Like, so centralization and decentralization. You know, I, I think, you know, I mean, I think, you know, the most sustainable unit of production is sort of more local, bioregional, um, you know, modes of pr- production in terms of food production, for instance. We would want to sustain some international supply chains, but that is, I think, the most sustainable unit. At the same time, we have we would have to maintain a kind of coordinating capacity between, if you if you want to call them communes, um, you know, on a regional and, and ultimately on a on a, a global level in the face of what is a planetary ecological crisis. I mean, you know, what I would want to get rid, what I would want to do is get rid of. The terrible mediator that is the nation state. So it's 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 the localism mm. and cos- cosmopolitanism without the nation state. And how do we, you know, h- how do we imagine a co- cosmo localism? I think is is something that is, is is a question that people should should take up. But I feel like this is this is this is offensive to a lot of people. Sensibilities. It, oftentimes it seems more like a, 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 a sensibility masquerading as a political program. I mean, there are attachments to to the treats <laughs> to, 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 to invoke an aspect of discourse. But there's, I mean, as it, when you were talking about you know deceleration in terms of slowing down as well. I mean, the extent to which, for example, things go so fast because you know we we move through various systems as we move through them. The the friction you know it produces data, it produces commodities. We we it, we get burnt out, so we we consume more and we buy more. And it reminds me actually a lot of what you're talking about with um. A kind of political praxis that is uh, currently going on in, in China of a movement called it. Uh, have you heard it called Tangping? Uh, the Life Flat movement. Yeah, I have. I've heard yeah, the about the it. decelerationist practice. And they have a manifesto actually. It's out on the Anarchist Library of all places, actually. Um, and it, it's it's very much it's very much sort of close to this, and especially in terms of so, you know, what are the systems, what are the pre- systemic preconditions of us needing to go so bloody fast all the time? And most of it is the state. As you said, the nation state keeping it as a essentially a money spinner to keep you know swerving on the any yeah. friction of out of the the circulation of capital so we can do it. But on that note, if we come up to the hour, just on that note, I want to say, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Oh, I mean, thanks, uh, folks. Against the Against the Vortex is out now. It is out at all good bookstores, and indeed, you can find it online over at zerobooks.com. Me and Anthony said before, I've also interviewed John Borman. That will eventually be coming out either in text, video form, or both. 
And of you know, there will be more Zardoz coming down the line from our comrades over at Repeater Two, and uh, I, I can't really say much more than that, other than to get you a little bit hyped. And I believe Anthony has also written something for that too. So th there's more coming down the pipeline. Yes. <laughs> All right, folks. This is me signing off. Thank you so much, Anthony. Again, we'll catch you Thanks. later. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.